Hi, let's talk about the nephron. The nephron is the functional unit of the kidney, and it comes in two basic varieties. There are cortical nephrons, cortical nephrons. Cortical nephrons sit a little higher in the renal cortex, and they're more ubiquitous. About uh, four-fifths or 80% of the nephrons in the kidney are cortical nephrons. There are also juxtamedullary nephrons. Juxtamedullary nephrons are the first ones that are being fed by afferent arterioles off of the cortical radiate arteries. These sit lower in the cortex, and they have a very elaborate nephron loop that goes very deep into the medulla. Juxtamedullary nephrons are only about um, one-fifth of the total population of nephrons in the kidney, but they are exceedingly good at pulling out more water from the filtrate than our cortical nephrons. And in other organisms, especially desert-dwelling organisms, juxtamedullary nephrons are, uh, are much more frequent than they are in humans. Now, when we look at the individual parts of a nephron, it, it's really quite simple. So we have the renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle consists of the renal or the Bowman's capsule, or just the capsule, that surrounds the glomerulus. And the glomerulus is a specialized bed of capillaries that converts blood into filtrate. That filtrate then travels through what's known as the proximal convoluted tubule. So it's a curly cue of bends and twists. The proximal convoluted tubule is the primary site of reabsorption for the nephron. So there's a lot of materials that leave the filtrate and go back into the cardiovascular system here. There's also a minimal amount of secretion there. From the proximal convoluted tubule, we move into the nephron loop. The nephron loop has a descending and an ascending limb. The nephron loop is good for um, catching little last bits of water in the filtrate that we want to reabsorb back into the cardiovascular system. And then beyond the nephron loop, we have the distal convoluted tubule that feeds into the collecting duct. The collecting ducts are usually held in common between several nephrons, and these descend through the cortex, and they end at the renal papilla. And right at the renal papilla is the point of no return for when filtrate really becomes urine. So the vasculature of the nephron looks exceedingly complex, but it can actually be quite simple. So recall, coming around the, uh, the bend is the arcuate artery, and that spawns the cortical radiate artery. And the cortical radiate artery gives rise to the afferent arterioles. Those afferent arterioles feed into the glomeruli. So that's half the battle there. Coming off of the glomeruli are the efferent arterioles. So these leave the glomeruli and they then spawn what are known as paratubular capillaries. These paratubular capillaries surround the entirety of the proximal convoluted tubule, the nephron loop, and the distal convoluted tubule. And what's going to happen is there's going to be reabsorption of materials from the filtrate back into the CVS, and then secretion of materials from the CVS back into the filtrate. Now the one difference for juxtamedullary nephrons versus cortical nephrons is that coming off of that efferent arteriole from the glomerulus, not only do we have the paratubular capillaries, but we also have something known as the vasa recta. The vasa recta are these straight vessels that come across and surround the nephron loop. These vasa recta are going to be very important for pulling away water from the nephron loop, and I'll show you how that's accomplished. Now, following the paratubular capillaries, we have some paratubular venules. You can see some there and there that are going to feed into the cortical radiate veins and then back into the arcuate veins. Those arcuate veins are going back into interlobar veins, back into segmentals, and then finally back into renal veins. Now, I'd like to take you step by step through the nephron and, and what's going on in each part of the nephron. 
So let's start here at the, the renal corpuscle. So we've got the renal capsule, also known as Bowman's capsule, and that's really going to surround the glomerulus. And it's going to be here that the process of filtration occurs. Filtration is going to be very important because we're taking blood and we're turning it into filtrate. And you can think of filtrate as pre-urine. What's interesting is given the amount of blood flow through the kidney, there are approximately 1,500 to 2,000 liters of blood flowing through the kidneys daily. And that process of filtration at the capsule is able to reduce that blood down to about 150 to 200 liters of filtrate. Now, if you can imagine losing 150 to 200 liters of fluid daily, um, that would be very problematic for your survival. You would, you would be desiccated in no time. Luckily, we have this process of tubular reabsorption where we pull materials out of the filtrate and into the cardiovascular system so that we can reclaim a lot of that filtrate, mostly water. So the, uh, the nephron, as such a dynamic filter for the kidney, is able to go from 150 to 200 liters of filtrate to about 1.5 to 2 liters of urine on a daily basis, which is a phenomenal feat of physiology. Now, from the corpuscle, we have the filtrate traveling along the proximal convoluted tubule, or the PCT. The proximal convoluted tubule is significant because this is the principal site of reabsorption in the nephron. So, in terms of the total amount of reabsorption, 66% of various ions, the salts that they form, and water are being reabsorbed there. 100% of glucose and amino acids, well, that would be up to the renal threshold of glucose, which is about 160 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. 80% of the citrate, the phosphate, the potassium, uh, urea, all of these things, the lion's share, are being reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. Things that are being secreted include bioactive substances, so pharmaceuticals, medications are being moved from the cardiovascular system into the filtrate, and ammonia as a byproduct of metabolism is being moved into the filtrate from the cardiovascular system. Now from here, blood is going to travel down into the nephron loop. Now the nephron loop is also referred to as the loop of Henle, and what happens is filtrate descends and as filtrate descends, sodium passively moves out of the filtrate and into the medulla. Well, water always is going to follow sodium, and so what we have is the outward flux of water from the filtrate. Now, the vasa recta, which are these vessels here, pick up that water, and they conduct it away from the medulla, so that water is now back in the cardiovascular system, and it leaves the sodium. And so what we have is quite a buildup of sodium. This becomes a richly hypertonic environment. And whenever we have a large amount of sodium building up places, that makes it even easier for water to leave. So more water leaves, water is picked up by the vasa recta and conducted away by the cardiovascular system as that renal medulla becomes more and more hypertonic. Eventually that filtrate is going to leave the nephron loop and go into the distal convoluted tubule. In the distal convoluted tubule we have a further refinement of both tubular secretion and reabsorption. Now there's going to be two populations of cells that are going to be significant for this process. The first being intercalated cells. Intercalated cells are going to be of supreme importance to helping maintain pH homeostasis because they're the ones that determine if bicarbonate ions and protons either stay in the filtrate or are reabsorbed or are secreted into the filtrate. And so depending on the conditions in the blood, these intercalated cells are able to either keep or secrete ions to finally adjust pH. The other population of cells are principal cells. And principal cells are going to be important for the final refinement of water 
reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubule by two ways. The first is by that renin angiotensin aldosterone or RAA pathway that we discussed previously. And what happens with these principal cells is that aldosterone, which is the final A in the RAA pathway, causes the principal cells to move sodium out of the filtrate, and as a result of moving sodium out of the filtrate, water is going to follow it. There's also a hormone called vasopressin, or antidiuretic hormone, that enables these principal cells to push water out of the filtrate as well. The primary site of reabsorption for water is going to be the proximal convoluted tubule, but the nephron loop and the distal convoluted tubules are also going to be very helpful for refining that. And then finally, here in the distal convoluted tubule, we have the ability to retain calcium. So parathyroid hormone secreted by the parathyroid gland is going to cause the distal convoluted tubule to keep or reabsorb any calcium that might be found in the filtrate at this point and push it into the cardiovascular system so that we can maintain the, the body's supply of, of blood calcium. So we've talked about the nephron, the different types of nephron, and the parts of the nephron, and what they're either able to keep through reabsorption or secrete through secretion back into the filtrate, which eventually is going to be excreted via the urine. Thank you.